Natalie can mute everybody, I think. Yes. If it gets bad. And ideally, in the chat window in WebEx, before you want to say something at the mic, please say, we'd like to say something at the mic. And we could all notice that pause and not step on each other. OK, so wrong window. Uh, uh, the presenters are going to end up with slides presented by me. So they need to say, as George Michael would do, Michelson would do, um, click so we can flip the slides like this. Here's your note well. Lake. All of the slides should be on the <clears throat> on the materials page by now. So I don't think we have any other agenda stuff to add than the, the five presentations we're going to talk about today. Starting with a panel, then I don't need to read these. Everyone can read these. Some draft status, which seems fine. Again, you can read these offline. I think maybe it's time to start the panel. Is everyone from the panel here, hopefully? Let me go get those slides. OK, so Randy, that's you and to start. Say click when you want to change. Got the message. Okay, so we've had uh, some for the last 10 years running the RPKI. We've had some issues. Um, we're going to have a panel that pretty much everybody but Joe is to blame for them because the rest of the people plus. Uh, Chris and a bunch of other people in this room are uh, part of the original misdesign. So, 20 lashes. Nick, click. Click. So, we're going to cover three items the manifest oopsie, manifests, and what to do about them, and CRLs. Um, I'm going to set each one up, and then the panelists in turn or in mass or whatever they feel like uh, maybe uh, five minutes uh, uh or 10 on each subject and we only have 40 minutes total i of course like everyone else have opinions Wait. um the opsupsy the ncc manifest opsupsy is an opsupsy they happen all the time the RIRs will learn that responsibility is at the top of an apex is tough. Um, they're stepping up to it year after year, it gets better. There have been opsupsies for every RIR, there have been opsupsies for every child CA. Their opsupsies are not numerable. Okay, we love them anyway. Blame does not move backwards. So we need to take a look at the checking and care that the root DNS people do before they push and automate that up the end. Um, sorry, right, and George, and so on and so forth. This is life in the big city when the RIRs decided to take on a role in routing. Um, who on the panel would care to speak first? And then, okay, so this is Russ. Um, I think that we um, know that the CRL needs to be put out according to the CP for two reasons. If you added to that one, a internet numbering resources removed, or two, if your key is compromised. So we need to have these, and we just need to make sure that everything is uh, consistent at the time of publication, 
I think the example that uh, Randy gave, used in the DNS is a good one. Just um, develop the tools to make sure things are, are consistent before you hit public. By the way, comments from other people are quite welcome. Here, well, Russ, that uh, connection was breaking up. This is Rob. Um, manifest F is one extra gotcha. It's just a technical thing you have to make sure of. At one point, when we started this, people were using very short uh, signature lifetimes for the EE cert in manifest. And that was a serious problem. It made manifest hard fail the way a certificate does rather than go stale the way a CRL does. I think at this point everybody has gotten that memo, but if anybody hasn't, it's important to use a long signature lifetime for the manifest EE cert. So the semantics are basically the same as for a CRL, where you know, it goes stale gradually rather than just falling off the cliff. Um, two things. Number one is, Chris, would you click please? Because clearly people want to talk about manifest and CRLs and not to beat up the RIRs for not so to click. Uh, secondly, Warren was queued up. Hey, speak up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes, I agree that we do need more tooling and, you know, this needs to be more stable. But I'm not entirely sure that the comparison to the DNS route um, is a good analogy because I think that the rate of change on that is much lower. And so I think it's more feasible to do some additional sort of manual checking. Um, so, you know, definitely needs to be better, but I'm not sure that that's a great analogy. Who are you, by the way? Warren Kamari, I guess. That, I said that before I started speaking, but I guess it was too quiet. Oh, you said it before you clicked your off mute. Um, Okay, so in general, manifests were poorly documented. Uh, Steve Kent, Steve, are you saying you wanted to speak? Yes. So Do this so. is Steve Kent. Um, in response to what Warren noted, uh, I agree that the frequency of change for manifests that has been adopted in the RPKI um, is is fairly frequent, and so one has to balance the ability to test that against the operational requirements of rolling them as quickly as people have decided they wish to. But I also think that the kind of test that uh, whoops, had a little whoops there for a moment. Um, that we were talking about are principally automated. So, uh, and Russ can tell me if that's not what he had in mind, but I think the uh, notion here is to have a set of software that you can run over all the products that are published, updated, et cetera, and then uh, just go ahead and run that before pushing it out. I think that's what Russ had in mind, and that's certainly what I would suggest. Yes, that's what I had in mind. Steve, can you restate the last sentence one more time, please? Yes, uh, what I was saying is that what I had in mind and what Russ has agreed he had envisioned is some software that you point at the collection of signed objects that you were about to publish and run it, and it's very um, anal about checking for consistency through all these objects. So it would basically be a form of relying party software, but perhaps a little uh, better documented in terms of, not better documented, but better at providing error feedback to warn the CA or the publication point maintainer, the repository operator of any potential inconsistencies. 
before pushing out a new set of sonic options. That's what uh, Russ and I are talking about. Thank you. I, I think VeriSign in pushing out um, and, and the other top TLVs um, have fairly seriously automated checks to them. When doing some of these R the RPKI RFCs, we stole from lessons that uh, DNS taught. So, so, so Randy, I actually believe there's two sets of tests: um, one run uh, by ICANN, and then another set run by VeriSign. And uh, I don't think we need to have the two role. Uh, you know, generator publisher thing going on here. But I do think uh, each time we have uh, some uh, experience like this, the set of tests that is run should grow. Yep, just like regression tests for software. Um, you know, the publishers will learn. Um, the Anybody like uh, Natalie or George, et cetera, to uh, run a uh, Apex CA care to comment? I don't see anybody in the mic queue. So, manifests 6486 needs to be updated. Um, Shame on us. Um, and we don't have um, authors we, to do this, and it really requires um, PKI clue. So, for instance, I'm not volunteering, um, even if I had the time. Yeah, you want to speak, yes. Steve? Yeah. Yeah, uh, John asked the, the question on Jeff about what needs updating, and that's a perfectly good question. It's section six, relying party use of manifests. As one of the co authors, and you have both, um, uh, you have two of the co authors of the document on this, George Michelson, who's uh, as well. Um, when we got to that part, we struggled with it, in all honesty because there were trade-offs. If we pushed to be very strict about some things, we were especially concerned that this would result in potential denial of service uh, of a particular form, that is a blind party uh, discarding lots of stuff because there was some uh, issue with the manifest uh, in terms of what was present, what was missing, et cetera. Uh, so we, provided trade-offs, we tried to discuss what these were, but we recognized that there was going to have to be a lot of experience gained in the RPKI by relying parties to figure out what would have to be done eventually. So I completely agree with Randy's observation that it's now time to go back and produce a new RFC where I'd like to believe that everything up to, to uh, section six is, is okay, but I'm certainly open to people pointing out things that they think need to be changed elsewhere. But mostly to go back based on discussions uh, in the working group to say, okay, there were choices. You could do A or B here, and we decided A is the right thing to do. And we started that discussion on the mailing list uh, a few weeks ago but it needs to continue and come to some hard decisions, proposed text, so that this can move on to the next phase. Really appreciate you coming off the bench on that one, Steve. And you and Russ both coming to return and helping. Um, and hope that uh, if we find one of us to uh, hold the pen and uh, you will continue to uh, at least advise, even if you won't be willing to do the heavy lifting.
That was a polite question. Oh, I missed the question part. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I will be happy to review revised text and provide feedback on it. Just as on the list, I tried to go back and look at <clears throat> the various situations in terms of what's missing, what's stale, what's current, etc. Not to offer suggestions about how it should operate, but rather to say, let's see if we can create a taxonomy of what the various um, combinations of states are of things. And with that in mind, find a way forward by saying, well, we're putting a stake in the ground. I, I recognize for my part that I was thinking more in terms of traditional security concerns about the service. And I think George Michelson <clears throat> on the list has made a very uh, persuasive argument that the real concern here is that if there's an indication based on a current manifest that certain objects that should be at a publication point are missing, then what can you trust about that entire publication point now? Because the objects that are missing, you don't know what they are, and they could influence um, how you interpret the rest of the information, both at that publication point and at uh, subordinate publication points in the RPK hierarchy. And that was not the way we were thinking about it. Certainly, it's not the way I was thinking about it uh, back in 2012 when we wrote this. I was concerned about um, minimizing circumstances under which we threw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. And in this case, well, you know, maybe the baby needs to be replaced. The, the baby's an alien. Yep. Either. The publication is bored or you've been attacked. Um, yeah, we're doing okay for time. Somebody else? So this yeah. is Russ. I, I'm willing to help, but I can't be the lead author on anything um, in this regard. Just have too many other commitments at the moment. Yep. Really appreciate it. You two keeping your eyes on it. Um, you know, why don't you state your uh, question out loud? You know? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so updating an RFC of, of this size and complexity can, can easily take one or two years before we get close to, to publication. Um, is there anything we can do in the meantime to provide guidance that some of the validator implementers are explicitly looking for uh, in, a, in a shorter time frame? Well, looking how it happened a decade or so ago is, you know, as the consensus forms in the working group, the code gets fixed and that doesn't require the IETF sausage to be made. I agree with Randy's observation. Um, while you're absolutely correct that formal RFC publication of a new version uh, will take a while. If we're focusing just on section six, and if we can get agreement in the working group on what the new section six should say, then Operators, uh, if there's agreement, can go ahead and say, we're going to go ahead and uh, start doing this. And we'll let the document make its way through the rest of the process. So I think the hardest part here really is just getting agreement on a new set of guidance that leaves less ambiguity with regard to our underlying party behavior. Once there is agreement, if the working group chairs have essentially a last call and there is agreement, then I think that's a perfectly good time for uh, software to be updated, et cetera, while the uh, document makes its way through the rest of the process. Speaking as someone who took 
eight years to get an RFC through to change a constant from 4K to 64K. Um, I'm patient with the ITF process and we knew it had to be happened in the first three months. So, you know, let's get agreement here and worry about the ITF sausage machine in a parallel universe. Uh, are we going to have the conversation over chat? I'm not objecting, but does every, is everyone actually seeing the chat? Because otherwise, Tim and uh, George, you really should uh, speak up verbally. Um, okay, can people hear me? This is Tim. Uh, so, um, yeah, what I said in the chat is that um, I think it will help if we move to a publication model using, well, as I'll propose later, RDP, because it will allow for deltas to be published atomically. So I think you can prevent a lot of the issues seen around uh, glitches where serial and manifest and objects are inconsistent, if you will. It leaves other things to be considered, obviously, but I think it will help. George? So my, my comment in chat is that I think if we are focused on Section 6, then specifically Section 6.5, the last paragraph, represents a problem. It only has one normative word. It's a should result in a warning. And I think what we are going to need is much stricter language. Um, I think that you are correct to focus on Section 6. And I think the tabular construction of the cohesion of different states of prior state, manifest, CRL, current state, and a decision logic that is less subjective is probably the outcome people are looking for. Steve? Uh, yes, two observations. I agree with George's observation that 6.5 is the really big issue that we seem to be dealing with here, and that we need to look throughout the whole section, but especially there, um, to try and use more normative language. And warnings, in the sense that I get from what I hear operators have expressed on this, is that warnings may not always be enough. They like more specific guidance about uh, what to accept, what to reject, and we should just do that going forward. With regard to Tim's comment, I'm not sure that I'm convinced that uh, our sync is really the big problem here. And I say that because in the document guidance, there is the observation of what you probably should do, which is to marshal all the objects for a consistent view of the publication point and then change uh, and put that out uh, atomically. And yes, there is a possibility that the line party could uh, be fetching in the course of this transition, but my belief, and I didn't write the software, so I don't know, well, I'd ask you know, somebody on, on the chat, like Rob Austin, did not, is that um, relying party software might well be able to detect this inconsistency, go back and do a refetch. So while RRDP may provide a long-term uh, preferable solution in terms of minimizing the likelihood of that, it's not clear to me that the problems that we're seeing Principally, a result of parsing. Um, this is Russ. In particular, if um, new objects were put in a staging area, validation tools were run against them, and then the staging area was transitioned to the place where RSync sees it, uh, I think that kind of a pipeline would um, allow RSync uh, to uh, work. That's not to say I'm opposed to what Tim's proposing. But I don't think it's the core of the problem uh, for similar reasons to what uh, Steve just said. I think the two issues are worth talking about. It's basic software engineering is update the data so it's consistent, move it out of staging to current. And 
If you can't do that, get a job somewhere else. <laughs> get a job somewhere else, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Software engineering 101. The data is consistent. Period. This is Rob. Sorry, I've had my hand up for a while and I don't have it. Sorry, with all the stuff in the chat, if people would stop typing into chat and just use it for hand raise, then I'll be able to uh, help people not get squashed. Rob? Um, two things. First of all, uh, I'm willing to review. I don't have time to be a primary author. Uh, secondly, um, I'm actually more on Tim's side than on the RDP thing. The, there are two issues. One is what a publication is actually changed a little bit when we bought our RDP and not, not exceptionally at the high level in terms of implementation. Um, because with first thing you have the concept of, well, basically there's a directory that's got stuff in it. And you might have things that are in the directory but not in the manifest. With our RDP, the way you determine what's in the publication point is by looking at the manifest or by just a big bucket of objects. So some of the semantics actually change a little bit there, and it would actually be useful to know whether we're trying to do this, including our sync, or we're doing the hooks to phase out of our sync, uh, just in terms of what the document really is possible. But the, unfortunately, it's not really possible to make our sync. It just doesn't work that way. Um, part of the problem is that you're at the mercy of the implementation. You don't really know what order things are going to get fetched in. You know, so you can do atomic writes and renames and all that at the uh, software level. What actually shows up on the other side, you don't know. You're within a certain window. Um, it was correct that one could go back and refetch, but it's a non terminated process. So that's in the same thing with the clusters. It's always slightly inconsistent in space. So at least our implementation never tried to do that, but those jobs we can put it together with what we were going to fetch this time. I figured we'll try next cycle. I'm not sure if it's correct to do that our time. We're still going to have to teach them to be a lot of people called publisher. And again, you're still going to have inconsistencies between different publication sites. We're going to see. Whoever's got their mic on and is typing, turn your freaking mic off. Um, but you know, within, within a single publication stream, it should be closer to the transactional model. Sorry, <laughs> Just a time check, Randy, you have nine minutes. Yeah, I know. Okay. Next click. So last we have CRLs. Um, they're critical. We like them. They're well understood because unlike manifests, they come from the history of PKI. So they're better defined and we don't have the holes. Okay. The idea to remove them is um, making massive chaos in the RFC hierarchy. Um, let's see who was first. Uh, looks like George. George, off mute. So I think it's important that we recognize an aspect of the distinction between positive and negative statements. All, all cryptographic statements are in effect only positive. I want you to believe me, here's my SIG. You don't have the anti-set of, I want you to believe me, here's my crap SIG. You only have, is my good SIG. So it is always a positive cryptographic test. Is this a valid statement? And it invites the necessity of having the ability to make negative statements. Now, Randy, you famously said, stop inventing things. 
when we tried to invoke creating negative statements where the negative was a negative assertion in routing. So we only have positive assertions at this stage as the targets that get made in our system. CRLs, CRLs are a negative assertion. Do not accept this otherwise valid thing. And I think that is completely distinct from what a manifest does. A manifest does not have a list of things not to be accepted. It is only a positive statement of acceptance of things. A CRL is necessary. So the idea of unwinding it, to me, makes no sense. It's, it's necessary because all statements in cryptographic sense are valid. And this is the only tool we have to repudiate things that necessarily need to be withdrawn. End of Let statement. Me, sorry. Thanks, George. Let me ask two questions then. Would anybody like to speak to either of the following two questions? One, is CRLs are poorly or under the five? Two, is their extraneous and should be removed? Otherwise, we can conclude. So, uh, Randy, this is Russ. I would think that maybe we ought to look at adding a paragraph to RFC 8211, which talks about um, what the consequences of suppressing a CRL are. Uh, I think we now know better what the consequences of suppressing a CRL are, <laughs> and we got it. We, we missed some things. Um, that's the only thing I think we should do. Jim? This is, this... Jim? Yes. <clears throat> so when I started making noises about CRLs, I was worried in particular about inconsistencies of, you know, even if you publish stuff in a new directory and change over, there may be race conditions with uh, validators getting things. Um, that was my main concern, that there's now this circular thing when you need to validate a manifest, you need to validate, you need to find its CRL, you need to verify that the manifest itself is not revoked by that uh, CRL, and then continue. Um, and while I do see great value for CRLs in general, the point I was trying to make is that for things that are already on the manifest, if and only if we accept that that's the sign for this, it doesn't make sense to publish something on a manifest and then also revoke it in a serial. Um, all that being said and done, I can live with the serials, um, especially because I think they have purposes outside of what's published inside the RPI repository, and there may be use cases there. See the um, RPSL signature uh, document, for example. Um, <clears throat> in any case, and I may be taking too much time here, but my biggest concern here is that uh, with all this, the, the things in section six of the uh, manifest, I think if that gets addressed, most of my issues are addressed. Because the, 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 all the local policy in terms of what we do we do if, that, that makes me nervous. So I hope that it, this makes it a bit more clear where I come from. Anyone else? Uh, this is Steve. Yeah, uh, with regard to Russ's suggestion for RSC 8211, I'll uh, get in touch with my co-author on that see about issuing data to address the comment that was made. I think it's probably a one paragraph update, Steve. Okay. Agreed. Anybody else before we close the gate? Thank you. Uh, Randy, sorry to interrupt uh, you. Uh, Job raised his hand. Sorry. No. Um, a point about the concept of local policy. I think 
maybe this is a misunderstanding in, in, in my mind, or maybe this is in a broader sense. Um, but in the last few weeks, having deployed some RPTI stuff in a network, uh, the concept of local policy for, for us is expressed through Slurm. That is the equivalent of local policy. And this concept of having local policy in, in, in the validation process itself uh, may not really exist. I, I don't know any operator that is using this local policy concept uh, or the liberty that some of the RFCs offer uh, to their advantage in a productive way. Uh, so if we revise some of the language around this, I think the words, the phrase local policy uh, should perhaps be omitted or, or removed uh, because local policy in, in context of routers for our network operators is what we put into the Slurm file or what we type into the router, but not validation policy. Does that make sense? It does to me. This is Steve Kent. Well, thank you, unfortunately, all gentlemen. Back to you, Chris. Jay, Jay has a question. Working hard. Oops. Sorry. Jay? Mute, Jay. No, skip the rest of the slides. Those are just back up. Jay? On you. He typed into Jabber the words, Tim's comment is interesting. Does it make sense that manifests can be revoked by CRLs? Certificate. Yeah, the, the manifest the manifest contains an embedded EU cert. All certs issued by a CA uh, can be revoked by the CA. So yes, it's just the way it works if we're going to do a PKI. Tim. Does it make sense for a manifest to include a CRL and its hash where that CRL revokes that manifest? No, that would be an inconsistency and we shouldn't do that. But is it possible is what Steve just answered. <laughs> that after it's issued, could the signer's certificate be revoked? Yeah. I I think you need to distinguish between what makes sense in terms of not trying to rewrite X509 versus what would just be an insane thing to publish. Okay. Um, I think we want to keep the CRL as to all the certificates, including the EU cert that's in the manifest, but otherwise we'll rewrite X509. I don't think we want to go there. As a separate issue, I think it would be extremely silly to publish a CRL and manifest pair where the CRL revokes the manifest. That would be a dumb thing to do, so don't do that. But it's a distinction about, between that and whether or not the protocol should allow it. I think the protocol has to allow it because that's 509. Did you have a question or you just want to go with what's in the chat? Uh, well, uh, we can we can do uh, additional constraints beyond the uh, natural X509, I think. 
uh, and enforcing that by, say, consistency checks, uh, as uh, suggested by Steve, uh, uh, probably, probably, probably makes sense. Yes. Chris, kick us off. Okay. I think that's the. Oh my God! Come on, Tim. Quick comment, and then I'll put I'll put Randy's slides up. Okay, no sorry about that. Um, well, <sighs> okay. I think it's really good to look at checking consistency in the future, in future work that we do. And I think a possible locus for that is actually on a publication server where stuff is being sent to. I think you can uh, add checks there that deltas are consistent, that manifests don't revoke themselves in the CRL that they say is current, et cetera. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks. Randy, your next slides. Okie doke. Um, your usual authors list. Uh, yesterday was a bad sysadmin day, so these slides are a little rushed. Next. Um, back in the NSF net days, Curtis Vilmizar updated the backbone peering on Wednesday mornings. Routing could not change until when next Wednesday morning. That was life. We do not remember it fun. Next, some of us remember when it took a day or two for DNS updates to propagate before we hacked in the notify mechanism. We do not remember it fondly. Next, as we roll out route origin validation using the RPKI, we should not do this again. And that's the state we're in. It can take two days for things to roll out. Now's the time to fix it before it really hurts people badly. Next. To remind you of the topology of how the data get from the user on the left to the router on the bottom right, Right. The user uses some application to update the CA software, which then publishes it in the resource PKI repository. Then relying parties gather it in something we often call the cache. They produce a validated cache. And that ends up being pushed to the router with the RPKI router protocol. You're going to see six variations on this slide. Next. These are the points we care about the time. Right? These are the points that influ influence how long it takes to get from the left side to the bottom right corner which is where it influences the actual routing on the network. Next. So, uh, how long do I have, Chris? Sorry. I'm not I think it was 10 minutes, so maybe you have another seven. Also. So I'm sorry, Tim, Tim and Jay, questions at the end, even though you're co-authors. Co so how often, how long does it take from when I enter the data on Wright's web page until it hits the bottom right? I'm, as an operator, I'm supposed to know that. And if I'm going to make a announcement change four di days from now, I should know when I must enter and create the role. Next, click. The CA has to both publish it in the up down protocol and publish it in the PKI. 
That should take seconds to a minute. Next, the relying parties have to gather. Our sink is heavy on the server. Therefore, once an hour seems a reasonable compromise. RRDP is much like 10 minutes seems reasonable. All these constants are what we're going to discuss in the next six months as we process this draft, right? These are just initial suggestions. Next, the router should pull from, it's, spe it's specified actually in 68 something or other, should pull once an hour at worst from the cache. Um, but note that the cache can notify the router we stole from DNS and say, hey, I've got some tasty new data. And the router can pull them. So it can be pretty responsive. That makes end to end in well under a day, a matter of hours at most. And that's kind of the goal. Okay. And I believe that's all I've got to say. So what's the mic cue? You gonna run it, Chris? I can, so far nobody has spoke up. Anybody all have right. questions? Oh, Tim and RV from last time, gotcha. Going once, going twice. No questions, okay, next. Next, we'll be back on time almost. This is Tim. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, yes, right. Thanks. I was going to ask for this night. So, I want to do a quick um, um, talk about uh, deprecating rsync um, <clears throat> and moving to RDP. Uh, I made a document uh, that I presented in that last face-to-face -face meeting. Um, and since then, I, uh, I had discussion with Randy and George, and they've come on board as well. This is not a working group document yet, um, but a spoiler is that I will um, ask for that formally on the list later. Uh, click, please. And excellent. Yeah. So what is the goal here? Um, I think it would be good to remove the dependencies on rsync for RPI validation uh, for all parties involved, at least from a, like say a 24 seven, um, on a 24 seven basis, click. Uh, why? Um, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this unless people wanna discuss more then at the end we can do so. Um, rsync is a great tool, but I think it's, um, um, it, it can be heavy on the server side, especially when the relationship is asymmetric and there's many uh, clients to the server. Um, and this can lead to delays of uh, RPI content making it to uh, routers. Uh, from the validation software point of view, async libraries are lacking. Uh, some people have made their own. Most people um, uh, just use whatever is on the system. And um, yeah, as I was saying earlier, uh, atomic deltas are hard. You can publish things in a new directory and, and change things around, but there can be race conditions when people are syncing in the middle of that. Um, so next, please. Like RDP is, uh, was um, proposed as an alternative or an additional thing in, uh, to begin with. It allows for scaling with, uh, with CDNs. Um, HTTPS client libraries exist in um, almost all languages, and it deals with deltas. Click. Um, there are constraints, though. If we say we want to move away from rsync, um, we have rsync. We have to deal with this, and uh, things have to keep working. We cannot just, you know, take all the wheels of the bus and let it crash. Uh, we have to do this, do this carefully. So, next, please. Um, so phase one, this is basically what the, 
world look like today? RSync is mandatory and RDP is optional. Um, RDP is supported by most uh, repositories uh, at the moment, actually, and most relying parties, but not all. Um, proposed phase one is, uh, next please. Proposed for phase one is that, well, there would be an update uh, to, um, got which RFC number for a moment, sorry, but um, the, the, the infra uh, RPKI infrastructure document, um, where it now says you must support um, RSync, there would be an addition uh, that says you must now also support uh, RDP as a repository server. Uh, this is something that should be verified uh, before we could move on to the next phase. Uh, click, please. When all relying uh, or all RPKI repositories support uh, RDP, um, well, current text says, well, let's then ask, well, make it a must for relying parties to use RDP and even go further and say that they must not use RSync. Uh, this might go a bit far for some people, but the reasoning behind that is that if we want to remove the operational um, obligation to run an RSync server, then I think you have to do this. Um, the other side to this is um, you need to do measurements, of course. You need to know um, whether relying parties, not only whether relying party uh, software uh, has made changes, but also whether people deployed it. Um, and then eventually, uh, next slide, please. Just before you go, George has a question, which may be for this slide. Oh, sure. You can do my question at the end. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. Then um, um, at the end, you can say, um, well, repositories must support RDP, but may support RSync. So that would remove the operational obligation to run RSync. Although I do see a use for still running RSync, and if it's not like, um, you find, try to find the words here. Um, it's not that hard to run an rsync server that people can access to look at objects. Um, but it's much harder to guarantee that it's available um, as a highly, you know, high availability service. And that's what I'm worried about. So with regards to validation, I think it would be good that validators did not depend on it, but it doesn't mean that people cannot run an rsync server. I would think that that's not that hard to do if you don't have that constraint that, you know, everybody validating must be able to access it all the time. Um, so that's why I, um, I phrase this as a may uh, for the moment. Obviously, this is all uh, introduction to discussion, hopefully more discussion later, uh, which brings me to the end. And uh, I think there's one more slide or two. Uh, yeah, so this is just a recap um, of what I just said. Let's not spend more time here now. But might be useful for discussion. Uh, next, I think that's all I had. Yeah, process. Um, so um, I think it would be good to have a discussion about this. I also will would like to ask uh, for adoption, but I'll do that on the list because that's where it should be done. And then process questions are also, um, well, currently this document includes a plan, a proposed plan, and proposed updates to RFCs for each of those phases. Uh, this may not be the best way to do things, but I think it helps to keep everything together to discuss uh, at this stage. Um, but later on, we may well find that it's better to separate out these uh, documents into a plan and different documents updating RCs for different phases. But anyhow, um, that's all I had to say about this for now. Um, so I'm happy to discuss things here now uh, on this or later on the list. Okay. I think it's George, Randy, and Natalie in that order. So my, my question is probably not material. It's just the observation. Do we want the formalism of the ordering of the fetch URIs 
in the published ASN1 because I don't personally believe it's a high likelihood that the order of presentation in the ASN1 affects the decision logic in a relying party validator about how it fetches. But the prior experience in the DNS is order of presentation of data elements actually does affect what people do. Um, should I say something about that? Please? Well, uh, essentially, RDP has its own uh, object identifier. Um, as a, it's just different access uh, method, essentially. So it's not an ordering of uh, schemes. But if the ordering of these things, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly. But I'm advocating a change to using the other method. I, I absolutely support adoption and process change to mandate use of RRDP and deprecate rsync. But during the transitional period when certified products are produced that have to publish where am I found, is it not a set of where am I found URIs? I believe it's a set. A set or sequence doesn't make much difference. But the question was, does the order of the presentation of these OID denoted objects matter? And my gut feel is no, because the direction to the RP is, if you're given both, please use RRDP first. The problem right. for a relying party is that when fetch fails, what do you do? And as an operator of a publication point, I can tell you, I see the same IP addresses doing both protocols. Sorry, Rob, I'm just cutting in for clarification. Uh, George, Tim actually told you something that may have been obscure there. It's not actually a list. Because of the implementation details in terms of the ASN1, it's actually two separate databases, uh, not databases, but it's actually two separate buckets of where the URIs are. They have different OIDs. So as a practical matter, all the implementations I know about treat them separately and aren't going to treat them as an ordered list based on the text here. So I don't think it matters. There could, of course, Great, be thank you. There comes up with a new one. May I? I can only assume we lost someone. Tim, are you still there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I wasn't sure that it was up to me to say <laughs> uh, to people to come to the mic. Uh, but I think Randy also raised his hand in that case. Randy, did you have another comment? Possible Randy fell off. Um, He's still there. He's just. So Natalie, why don't you go? And then if if Randy shows up again, he can uh, speak up. Okay, Tim. Um, I might be stretching this here a bit, but uh, if the draft name is deprecating uh, rsync. Uh, and when I look at this slide and I see uh, repositories rsync optional and relying parties uh, rsync none, I would like to opt already for the last phase to be rsync repositories none. Um, because we all know how it goes when you have to maintain stuff. Um, if, if you think it's optional, people will expect it. Um, and I would then, in that case, at that very stage, would rather get rid of it. Or at another phase, phase four, where the repository's optional be then becomes none. End of remark. Um, <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm not completely decided on, on this, to be honest. What seems more most important to me is that you don't have 
to have a rsync repository available all the time for validation to work. And that when ri uh, writing validation software, you don't have to, <clears throat> sorry, have to support rsync because it's an additional code path. Uh, that may depend on things being installed that you don't have control over. Um, that was my mind about it. That being said, I'm not against passing repositories being available, especially for other purposes. Um, but yeah, I think this is a question to be discussed. I mean, if all we end up doing is um, that there are now, that, 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 that are now two um, um, mandatory uh, mechanisms, then yeah, I'm not sure that it's uh, going to bring all that uh, much value. Ben? Should I say next or Natalie, did I answer your question? Like, do you have a follow up comment on that? No, no, I'm good. I'm done. Thanks. All right, then I guess, um, unless ben. anybody in particular wants, yeah, who's this? Ben and Rudiger. Yeah. And me after them. Yes. So uh, Ben is highest, I guess. So Ben can start, I suppose. Ben may be muted. Ben, do you want to talk? Rudiger? Yeah. Uh... Yeah, well, okay. If you uh, if we run in parallel two mechanisms, uh, obviously that kind of creates also the question. Well, okay, what's the consistency between the two representations? And as remarked earlier, inconsistency can happen. They should not. Uh, now, uh, uh, Tim, your uh, point for phase three is there should be no operational uh, reliance on the uh, rsync, which uh, kind of uh, makes the inconsistency uh, a little bit moot. Um, but you are saying, yeah, well, okay, we might want to keep the rsync around for uh, kind of non-operational other requirements. And uh, yes, I could imagine uh, that uh, it might be a nice thing to be able to uh, query point-wise uh into the uh repository system for specific objects uh, but uh yeah well uh, uh one might one might imagine actually that for uh, after uh, uh identifying the use cases for such access uh rsync might be a way of doing it but it might also it might also be uh, that one actually chooses some other mechanism uh, whether it is some uh, api whatever um, or other protocol uh, might be might be uh, a solution where well okay if, um, the consistency at least uh, uh, just disappears. So that's it. Yeah. Um, I have w w one comment about that. But um, so great to have this this discussion. Looking forward to more online. I guess um, part of where I'm coming from is that there are async URIs defined in the standards and. Um, they're really convenient because um, objects, when they have names, it's much easier to, to talk about them and uh, figure out what's going on. And if there's nothing available at all, um, that might raise some eyebrows. Uh, although there are parallels with uh, XML where namespaces are defined with HTTPS uh, URIs and there may not be anything there. Um, 
I just think it's convenient if you can get an object. All that's being said and done, the URIs are included in RDP. And if you pass the XML and you pass the base 64 in it, you can find all these objects as well. It's just a little bit more work. Um, and with that, I'll just pass on to the next person. There's still anybody else? Um, Chris, do you have a, are you queuing? I think my thing doesn't matter, but is if Ben's back to working mic? Three, two, one. Maybe Ben, use the uh, chat. Meanwhile, we'll skip to the next person. So, yes, Cones, who I. Yes. Um, hello. I guess you can hear me. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so, um, let's just move to the next slide. And um, we're here the, uh, to talk about this, which is not a cyber ops draft. And we just, uh, just resumed work. Um, on AS cones and similar work is being performed here inside ROPS with uh, ASPA or ASPA. So it's also good to get feedback from other working groups. Uh, we've had, uh, I think in the last couple of days, a, a series of uh, feedback coming in from this working group that we didn't get from Pro. So what has happened? Uh, next, please. So I'll be quick here. What has happened? We have a new additional author. We have Melchior, uh, who has joined me and uh, Jo. Uh, we have looked um, at the security model because we were told that that was the culprit of what we had to work on. And together with that, we have looked at uh, a couple of new models for building prefix lists. So for actually using then the, the AS cones. So uh, what does this mean? So let's look at the security model in the next slide. Um, basically, when you add uh, an AS cone to another AS cone, this requires an acknowledgement. If the holder, the owner of the AS cone you're trying to add to your AS cone doesn't acknowledge it, this is not a visible change. So this avoids anyone adding anything random to their own customer cone, uh, which means uh, we, uh, we're we going to add a little bit more security to what we have now in AS sets. Um, on the other hand, if you add an ASN only to an AS cone, the acknowledgement is optional. And why do we have this? This is because um, the idea is to keep it simple for those uh, stub ASNs at the edge of the internet where they don't have to do anything. And they might not even know that they have something to do. Um, the acknowledgement is registered in the AS cone as a Boolean value in validated field for each entry. So we have a value that can be zero or one. And based on this, we build a way to build filters. In the next slide, please. Let's see how this turns out to be. Okay, so um, you get basically loose. That is the, you have four ways of building the prefix lists. Loose, opportunistic, almost strict, and strict. For loose, we get any ASM, any AS cone, and the AS cone indicated by your downstream. So you get everything. In opportunistic, you get any ASM and any AS cone, but for the, AS for the ASNs, you only pick the ones that have the validated field set to one, so the ones that are validated. So what you do is you say, give me in my in this AS cone all the uh, validated entries, only the validated entries. Then we look at almost strict. That's the next step. Um, you walk the tree 
of your of your customer cone, and you uh, once you find a an entry that is not validated, you remove the entire subtree, which means you basically punish that customer or sub customer so that uh, they go back. They could go back and say. Um, tell their customers to validate their entries. And then strict is the one where you only consider an AS cone if each and every entry has been validated. Um, so this is, these are recent um, additions that we did to the draft. So if you are interested in this, I would suggest go and have a look. Um, but why am I also presenting here? Because I want to connect to the next uh, presentation. And next slide, please. Um, yeah, before, my... before you go, there's a question which may be for this slide or the previous. So oh, yes. To go yes. Over MIT Radier. Okay, please. I'm okay to wait for, uh, until the end of slides. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, the, there, are, there are possibilities of integrating this with uh, ASPA HASPA. Uh, the two ideas have a lot in common. One looks one way in the uh, relationships, the other one looks the other way around. Um, and maybe it could be worth considering unifying them or just building something to make the two systems interoperable. And the um, reasoning behind this is also while uh, implementations need to be made at one point for one or the other, or maybe, it would make sense to have both at the same time. So you might try to make the two go uh, hand in hand and um, allow the operators to just uh, do one single implementation for both of the object types and the, and the systems. So with this, I'm done and I'm happy to get questions. Alex, Steve Kent, and then Job. Okay. Uh, Alexander Azimov. Uh, so, I will not address uh, the last slide where you are speaking about ASP integration because it's a broader question and we can discuss it offline. My main question is about this idea of um, some kind of inheritance uh, between uh, uh, ice cones. So, let's say that I have a customer and this customer is another customer. So there is a sequence of three. And what should I do if uh, this second level customer uh, have an ice cone and uh, it is not verified by, by my direct customer? So you mean the, um, the customer of the customer has not verified its yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, the, yeah. The, the problem of uh, uh, the, of the inclusion of ice cones or ice sets. So, and uh, what I know about the current ice set deployment, it's getting worse and worse uh, when we are going from uh, tier ones to the edge, and there is little chance that you will be able to fix the edge. And from the edge, there will be more errors, and so you will be just learning and getting a broken ice cone as you are getting now broken ice sets. Oh. Okay, so if that ASN, so the customer of your customer is a stub, like they don't provide any transit, they don't need to have an ASN. You never if, know. If, he, he, may be, he, he may have uh, providing some Mm -hmm. Small transit or something like this. Okay. Uh, so if, everybody is using ASS. Yeah. If they provide AS, if they provide transit, then they should have an, a cone, and then at that point they should know they have to basically. Uh, well, the the their their transit would include them in in their cone, and then they they would acknowledge that they would have to acknowledge that. So. In the idea is that they would get a sort of a notification by an email or something else from their um, from from the RIR where the um, holder of the ASCOM comes from. 
and they have to go in and check and check the, the a box that says I'm okay and my ASCON gets inserted in here. If they if they knew they if they know they had to create an ASCON, then they should know at this point that they need to acknowledge their ASCON being inserted into someone else's ASCON. So uh, just to summarize, my concern is that the core difference between ASCON approach and ASP approach is that in ASP, the relying party is your provider. And with some extent, you can believe to your provider. In ASCON, your relying party is the cone of your customers. I don't believe in such relying party, but we can discuss it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's my misunderstanding. I think we should discuss this. So next one was Steve Kent. Hi, this is Steve. Could you go back uh, I think, uh, these two slides? Yes. So what concerns me is the term validated and the corresponding Korean data structure. This seems to be a validation that's asserted by the entity publishing this object, but I, as a relying party, am merely trusting them to have correctly asserted that it's been validated, I think, and that concerns me a lot. Um, what we try to do throughout the RPKI is to avoid circumstances where possible where any operator can make an assertion that can't be appropriately validated or verified, let me say, um, using the strict hierarchic uh, assignments for ASNs and address space, that's the backbone of this. So am I misunderstanding? Is it in fact possible for the entity publishing an AS cone to turn on that validated field, but I as a relying party really have no way of determining if the validated status is correct? Uh, no, that happens on the uh, in the database itself. It's not for me as the holder of an AS cone to, to validate the entries in there. Uh, so I'll I add, let's say I have my, my AS cone and I add you in there. I, well, I add your AS cone in there. You would have to, you would receive a notification from the, uh, let's say the RIR where I am from, where my ASN is registered because the AS cone pertains to that uh, database. And you would have to go in and say, okay, I, I'm okay with you adding my ASCOM to your ASCOM because I'm a customer of yours. And then the validated field would change from zero to one. And who changes that validated field? Uh, the RIR. That yeah, one. that's my concern. Um, okay. You're, okay. You're mixing a combination of an activity by an RIR with another database into mm -hmm the RPKI. I, I think for this to be viewed as secure, uh, a different approach needs to be taken to propagate this information in a fashion that all relying parties can make use of. Just an observation. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm happy to discuss this further. It's, um, it's we, uh, we know this is not perfect. We know this needs to, to be improved and we're ha happy to get any feedback about this. Thank you. Yop. Joke Snyder's NTT. Um, can you go to your last? Can you go to the last slide? Yeah. Uh, so about integrating the two. Um, in my mind, AS cones is. Uh, let's call it a thought experiment, to see if we can migrate some functionality that exists in the IRR, but not in the RPKI, uh, from the IRR to the RPKI, because AS sets are commonly used. Now, ASPA, on the other hand, is an attempt to automate uh, peer lock 
style configurations. It, if that's what I hope to get out of it. And I think those two serve very different goals of different applications, different uh, positions in how we construct filters uh, on eBHP sessions. So I, I, I'm not seeing an integration path given that the, the purpose and intent of, of the two approaches is very different. Uh, and I, I, I also don't think it, it would reduce work in, in any uh, meaningful sense to, to combine the efforts. Uh, so I, I, my preference would be to keep the two efforts separate and uh, just see how things go from there. Okay. End of comment. Okay, thanks. Uh, next one is George, I think. Hi. So I am really echoing a comment I have said to Job when he first talked about AS cones. Section two of your draft states the objects are stored in ASN1 and are digitally signed according to the same rules and conventions applied for RPKI ROA objects. ROAs are only signed by address holders. They are not signed by ASN. So if your intent is to make an assertion that is checkable against the rights of an ASN holder, the question that I put to Job at the time, and I'd repeat here, is who signs? Because I believe your policy definition component is not a policy statement of the address holder, it's a policy assertion of the ASs. And so you probably need to modify the semantic intent behind signing to clarify who signs. That was mm -hmm. it. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I was taking notes. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Okay. Randy. Oh, hi, Massimo. Uh, uh, the security model uh, still looks quite dubious. Uh, uh, and uh, George's remark that uh, uh, the uh, signing relation uh, is at least uh, wrongly documented um, uh, is potentially just one indicator of it. Um, quite clearly, uh, the AS cones are supposed to be statements by about the policy of an AS. So it has to be signed by the AS and originating from that resource path. Um, the validated bits uh, are obviously uh, a very interesting thing with regard to the security model. Now, this is the point where I could where I could see how ASPA and AS cones meet, because you could uh, imagine a system where you do AS cones and. Uh, essentially, the AS cone objects don't by themselves don't have uh, the validated bits, but the validated bits are collected by looking at the ASPAs that are confirming which are the client ASs of a transit provider. But uh, that does not that does not look like uh, something that's going to fly uh, 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 nicely that looks like uh, a plane designed like a pig and yes we know pigs can fly we just have to apply sufficient trust thanks thank you and randy let's see if the mic works Hello, one 
two, three. Yep. Yeah. Woo woo. Uh, hi, I'm Randy. I'm an AS addict. Um, one of the earliest ones. We should also know that Yob is an AS addict, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so we really would like authentic AS sets, but those of us with even small bits of security code do not understand the authentication model here, never have, um, even though it keeps changing. So one way to poke at that is that issue in today's presentation is you have a number of parties, each acting through a number of agents to construct approval. How is that redrawn or deconstructed? I am no longer Yelp's customer. I moved to Chris. How is my removal from Yelp's AS code unwound? We the, the, we have also worked that out in the in the in the new version of the product, and um, uh, if you are the, um, the holder of an AS cone that's inserted in another AS cone, you can just ask to be removed. You, should, you just ask for removal, and then it just gets removed. While um, no, 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 it doesn't do it. Sorry, I need to be able to formally revoke. Ask is not a verb. No, 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 no. You don't. So I have to formally remove it from your AS cone. Somebody fetching an AS cone must be able to show that it is invalid. Yeah, we have we have thought about that, and uh, you can remove yourself from another your your AS cone from another AS cone. You can do that. And um, a, a holder can remove you as well. So uh, have have a have a look at the uh, at the latest draft at the zero two version, and you'll see that we have thought about that. There is uh, wording about that. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? We'll skip on to the next. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And the last it should be, which is Alexander. Okay. Slides are coming. Here you go. Black font. Okay. Oh, wait. Surprise. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, that's a standard problem for me. Okay, now we're better. Uh, it's okay. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Alexander Azimov. Uh, I work for Yandex, and uh, here will be a um, uh, very quick update on ASP related drafts. Uh, next slide. So, here is our plan for today. I'm going to give a, uh, you a quick overview of recent changes in the drafts, discuss a few left questions, and show results of the evaluation that was done in Yandex Network. Next. Uh, as you may know, the original ASP followed a uh, raw design. It had multiple records for each custom autonomous system. Uh, which they together formed a set of candidates for the verification procedure. To prevent possible synchronization issues, we changed semantics of SPA object. So that uh, a record will have a sequence of providers, and there must be only one record per custom autonomous system. This guarantees atom uh, atomicity of updates in the uh, rears. The second part of this atomicity is uh, RTR protocol. Next. The suggested ASP PDU uh, directly reflects the object. 
So when we have enough data for selected autonomous system, it uh, replaces the stored record, both in the cache and in the router. Uh, though no risk condition may happen. Uh, there are a couple of questions that haven't been resolved yet. Uh, how, first one, how we, uh, we should work with default free networks, such as T1s. Uh, there are two possible solutions uh, for such a scenario. We may follow row zero style or use empty set. Speaking for myself, I have no preference in this meta. Rain devotes for the empty set. If nobody will stand up and shout uh, uh, that they want to keep with a space zero, Randy will win. Another and more important question. Should we have different ASP records for IPv4 and IPv6? To give a proper answer, I made a small research to start the difference between customers in IPv4 and IPv6. Next, please. So how I did it? I, look, I took a known set of tier ones which have uh, peering connections with each other. If I saw a path with two tier ones present, I considered all rightmost path as an upstream path. If I saw a single tier one uh, in the path, uh, the result was nearly the same with the exception that there is no guess about the link between, as in this drawing, between A1 and T1. The flow path uh, should consist of a uh, customer to provide a pairs, but there is some noise uh, from the route leaks. The level of this noise was out of the scope of this research, but it is expected that it will not have significant impact uh, on the comparison results. Next. So, what we got? As you can see from the drawings and from the numbers, there is still significant difference between IPv4 and IPv6 connectivity, which justifies different ASP records for different address uh, uh, families. I hope that RTR protocol will uh, 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 change its speed with the next update. Next. Uh, now, evaluation. The basic idea was to check algorithms uh, described in, uh, in the verification draft at scale. So I created next setup. I collected BMP data from border routers and used BMPM CCT, thanks to Paolo, uh, to pass and organize uh, the flow of data. In addition, uh, I created 18 ASP records, which represent ASP0 for well-known uh, T1s, and also I specified ASP records or Yandex. Next. And here is an ex uh, example of what we got. On the drawing, you can see Magia leak by Vietel. I was also able to confirm this instance uh, incident with uh, data plane monitoring. A butter drawing is an example of another kind. The ASP logic is capable to detect leaks that are coming from providers. In addition, BMP feed uh, of HRIB in gives easy access to paths that may include your own autonomous system number. Together, it gives a way to detect leaks that are happening for your own address space. Previously, such monitoring could be done only with external data sources. You can see examples of invalid ice paths for Yandex address space that were detected uh, during last month. And the next final slide. So, where are we are now? Uh, the foundation seems to be ready. We have three documents that together represent ASP object, verification procedure, and RTR PDU. There are a few questions that still need to be resolved, but I do not see any showstoppers. We have implementation on top of board and now large scale check of ASP logic that was done inside the Yandex network. That proof to have value beyond original expectations. So it has value that is more than described in the draft currently. I feel uh, that after some work on the text, we should be ready for working group last call. Any questions, suggestions, comments, please? Rigor.
Rudiger Volk, you're up. Sorry, it's really hard to unmute. Um, so, uh, small, small question on the ASN1 change. Uh, uh, why uh, is use of a sequence and not of a set type uh, proposed? Uh, set type, uh, I think, would be very appropriate and uh, obviously also would enable the empty set to be used for something. Mm, yes, we can use the set. I don't uh, see any problem here. And empty sequence and empty set have nearly same semantics. So uh, th this is Russ. Can... I'd like to object to that. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Do not use a set there. While it does have the semantics Rudiger wants, the uh, DER encoding requires sets to be sorted, and you just don't need the hassle. OK. Job. Um. In the last slide, it was suggested that perhaps uh, things should move towards uh, working group last call. Uh, but I would like to ask the group that we go a little bit slower. Uh, as it currently stands, this working group has significant work ahead of itself to improve the, the validation strategy around manifests and CRLs. Uh, and, and from a time perspective, I, I would like to do a similar evaluation as you have done here of them in NCT's context to be able to, to support the documents or point out that there are some, some corner cases that are problematic. Um, my fear is that if we go into working group last call, we exceed the available bandwidth of the working group and, and perhaps individuals such as myself. Uh, so, my request would be that we go slower uh, so we can carefully analyze what exactly this does before we go into working group last call. Uh, so, I would agree that we may need another verification. Uh, to make and, my point clear, yeah, I was I, not asking for the working group last call the next day. Uh, to, for example, you have time. Uh, to check the logic of SP inside your network. Great. You can uh, give us some other guys that are ready. It will be even better. The more, te yeah. the more testing we will have around ASP, the, uh, the more chances that we will not, uh, that we will not need fixes, ad hocs, and then uh, other funny things. And I, I want to extend a compliment to you. I think uh, how you are approaching whether ASPA is a viable concept or not and running these types of evaluations is uh, very cool. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Andy? Andy, Marcus and I, Jay. Um, I, I think the discussion of CRLs and manifests is entirely orthogonal. Um, the working group has been doing almost nothing. Um, talking about other people's resources is something I try not to do. Um, so I'd rather just focus on ASPA. Um, <clears throat> I think, as uh, Alexander said, having you know, somebody else play with it in their network <clears throat> would be brilliant. Um, but. Um, I think part of the inclination to a last call is that seems to be the only way to get people to read drafts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's why I think whatever it takes to get people to read it, whatever it takes to get you to play with it, yo, um, is a win. And I 
Okay. Is there anything else? Uh, there is a one thing that I've missed you know, on the last slide. I would like. So when I was just checking the status of uh, RTR uh, update, I found out it's the draft is still pending approval from the chairs. I was surprised, and I think it's something that we can easily fix it. Okay, we can certainly do that, Yunan. Yes. Hi, hi, Alex. Alex. Um, so uh, I have a question. Uh, which I had when I was uh, reading uh, your drafts, which is not quite related to your today's presentation. I'm not sure if it's been asked or, or being answered. So uh, I'm wondering how do you uh, represent uh, the lateral peering relation using, uh, you know, the ASPA profile or, or object, uh, object, object? I mean, do you use two different pairs, like two C two P pairs, uh, pairs to represent a P two P pair, or you just don't represent the P two P uh, relations? Uh, the, one of the key ideas of these drafts is that we do not represent P two P pairs at all. The only oh. thing is uh, this: the ASP uh, object uh, is is uh, described is customer and the sequence of upstream providers mm -hmm. so uh so so that being said uh when we have like two successive uh p2p links uh for that situation uh, the spa verification won't be able to uh you know detect the uh, the leak right no no the spa will be able to detect uh, such misconfiguration because we will look at the if we are receiving a prefix from a peering link, we're expecting that all sequence uh, in the ice path represents customer to provide the pairs. And two peer uh, to peer links are bound to each other will be uh, an invalid path in these terms. And so, uh, that's why uh, it's enough to use only customer to provide us registration to detect uh, such misconfiguration. Uh, uh, did you just say uh, you can detect, you are able to detect the, uh, the two successive P2P links? Yes, yes, it's possible and uh, it's working, working from box. How? Uh, once again, uh, let's say you have three, auto th three autonomous system numbers, autonomous system one, autonomous system two, and autonomous system three. The Auton System 3 is a, a receiver. Yes. And Auton System 1, uh, Auton System 2, and Auton System 3 are peers. Uh, are may, peer, may, be, may be peering with each other. Uh, so, according to the draft, when a prefix is received by Auton System 3 from Auton System 2, mm -hmm. it uh, will be treated as a uh, prefix that is a re uh, the path should be. Uh, upflow path. So yes. it will be expecting that out on system one and out on system two is customer and provider. Yes. But if out on, uh, out on system one is signing uh, ASPA, out on system two will not be included in the list because they are peers. And using this data, uh, out on system three will be able to detect the leak that happens for address space that belongs to Auton System 1. So Auton okay. System 2 doesn't need to cooperate. Okay, I, I think I can take the question, uh, you know, uh, to the mailing list. Uh, okay, sure, I, sure, I, sure. I, yeah. Okay. Doug, do you want to ask your question? Um, I was just asking how you, how you can tell partial deployment a missing ASPA data on some links from a lateral leak? Uh, so, uh, for a partial deployment, there are two scenarios. First scenario is when there is a mistake. If there is a mistake, as I described uh, a few minutes ago, there is not, it's not a big deal. Because uh, uh, if we have a, a signing party, 
somewhere in, in the path, uh, the receiver will be able to, to detect a leak in most cases. Uh, if we are speaking about malicious activity, at the partial deployment to secure your path, you need a secure upflow path to, uh, uh, to tier ones. If you are tier one, the, uh, uh, the situation is simple. Just create a, what is now called a space zero, or one day will be named uh, a space uh, empty, something like this. Uh, if you are tier two, to secure your path, you need to make your upstream providers to uh, sign SP, uh, SP empty in, ad, in addition to your own SP records and so on for tier 3, tier 4 and, and whatever but in the real world uh, uh, the security problems is, are not the biggest problem at the moment but anyway, uh, the opportunity for partial deployment still exists even for security issues when the leak is Malicious intent. Doc? I see it in the chat. Um, I don't hear the yeah. reply. Oh, uh, it's okay. Uh, both of your scenarios, you talked about errors and sort of malicious intent. I was just talking about good old partial deployment. So I, I get I get your point, right? Is you need a, a, a chain of ASPA records to the tier one. And that's- security, yes, yes. Right. Or uh, getting benefit, no. Okay, we can talk about it on the list. Okay, okay. And another question. Last question. Yeah. Uh, for partial deployment, uh, kind of, uh, I could view things like, well, uh, where we do not have the deployment at the edge. Uh, well, it's the choice of the AS uh, whether they want to protect or not to do the ASPA or not. Um, and yes, for having the full path uh, checked, uh, of course, uh, the partial deployment uh, does not protect when you transit, uh, does not protect fully when you transit uh, some networks that do not do ASPA uh, and, uh, and protect uh, uh, for you none, uh, I think ASPA as it stands is fine and uh, very helpful um, for protecting uh, peering relations. One could consider doing essentially the same data structure as ASPA. Uh, for uh, part for ASs that want to protect uh, their external relations uh, being checked in AS paths uh, observed elsewhere uh, by doing essentially the same data structure and listing their peers that they, where they uh, authorize uh, the appearance of uh, the peers in the AS path, uh, but that would be uh, essentially a completely different uh, RPKI uh, assertion than the ASPA. It would just be structurally, this, uh, uh, or could be done structurally as the same. Uh, and I would not, I would not uh, suggest going there until we have actually transferred the ASPA uh, into RFC status. And I will. Well, thank uh, you for say... your. Um... Sorry. Yeah, please uh, go ahead. So uh, okay, okay, I will. I will follow up. Uh, so. 
I would really like to highlight that the signing peers have another kind of problem, and it, the problem is called transparent access. When you have a lot of peers, when you, uh, and you happen to be uh, to have uh, to be a directly peering according to the ice path, but you never know the full list. Yes, kind of using using the peer uh, authorization set uh, would uh, essentially preclude using using transparent root servers for peering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll talk to you both so on the mailing list. Sure. Okay. Any input we are... related to ASP is very welcome. We're just about out of time. So there's any last questions? I think that there's a... Uh, there's some discussion to be had in a follow-on, so I think we'll try and gather up some uh, agenda items if there are any and propose maybe a, in three weeks about the same time um, another interim meeting, which, again, probably only attend if there's stuff that you're concerned about. Hopefully. I'm good? As I ask, people will not, not reply because of the mic. Okay, uh, we'll talk about it on the mail list. I think that's it for today. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.